We're focusing on the present moment, watching the breath in the present moment, watching the mind in the present moment. What's the theory behind that? Why are we doing this? Because after all, there's not much here. There's so many other issues out in the world right now. Why are we focusing here? It's because the choices you make in the present moment have power. You can't go back and undo your choices in the past. And as for your choices in the future, the more skillfully you can make your choices right now, the more likely you will be to make skillful choices then. It's because our choices influence the extent to which we suffer and don't. means we have to be responsible right here. Other people have to be responsible for their choices. We can do our best to try to influence them in the right direction, but that influence tends to be more powerful the more skillful we are in our choices. So we have work to do. The Buddha discovered the power of the present moment in the course of his second knowledge. In his first knowledge, he had seen himself being reborn after dying many, many, many times. And he noticed that he didn't stay the same. There was one theory back at that time that whatever you were, you were going to be reborn that way. If you're a human being, you'd be reborn as a human being. If you're a Brahmin, you'd be reborn as a Brahmin. If you're a dog, you'd be reborn as a dog. But his first knowledge, he saw that that was not the case. His levels of being went up and down. So the question was, why? So he took the larger picture. Instead of looking just at his own lives, he looked at all beings throughout the cosmos, seeing them passing away and then being reborn. And as he saw the larger picture, he could also see that there was a pattern. It's based on their actions. So he looked more carefully at their actions in general, his own actions, their actions. Other people had gotten that knowledge in the past. But they'd gotten waylaid by the question of, well, given all of these changes, what is it that stays the same? Who is it that gets reborn? But he saw that the, the question was not the who, it was what was the action, and how do actions give results? Because other meditators in the past had also seen that there were cases where someone would do good in his lifetime, and they would be born in a good place. Others would do unskillful things in his lifetime, and they would be reborn in a bad place. They came to the conclusion that it was deterministic. If you do good, you've got to be reborn in a good place next time around. If you do bad, you've got to be reborn in a bad place. But then there are others who saw cases where people did good in this lifetime were reborn in a bad place, or did bad things in this life and were reborn in a good place. So they came to the conclusion that your actions had no influence on this at all. So the Buddha looked into it more carefully, and he saw that the cases where someone who had done good things in this lifetime but had gone to a bad place afterwards is either because they had done bad things beforehand or bad things after, or more importantly, had embraced a wrong view at the moment of death. And vice versa. Those who had done bad things went to a good place, either had good things in the past, good things after the bad action, or they'd embraced a right view at the moment of death. And even the cases where people did good things and went to a good rebirth, they also embraced right view at the moment of death, and vice versa, which shows you the power of that moment of death. The views you adopt at that point can reverse or get in the way 
of the influence of a lot of actions in your lifetime. Now, it doesn't automatically undo them, it just delays their results. But sometimes delaying the results if you had if you had bad actions, but you embrace right view. And go to a good place. Maybe in that good place you start practicing the Dharma. That opens an opportunity to get out. As in the case of Angulimala. So the present moment has a lot of power. And you want to make sure you maintain right view all the way. And part of right view, of course, is saying the present moment has a lot of power. And your choices have a lot of power. And the level of the views that would get you reborn in a good place. You believe in the principle of action, that it's through your actions that you shape your life now and into the future. That's something you want to hold to in terms of the right view that would get you out of the system entirely. That's the Four Noble Truths and the duties appropriate to that. Hold to that as well. The two levels are connected because they both have to do with actions and results. Similarly, the Four Noble Truths get more into the mind. The actions that are causes are either craving, least suffering, or the Eightfold Noble Path. And the skillful side is the Noble Eightfold Path, which leads to the end of suffering. So again, action and result. That's a principle the Buddha said he couldn't prove to anybody just by talking to them. They could prove it for themselves by putting things into practice. In order to put it into practice, they'd have to accept these things as right view. Notice that's right view. It's not right knowledge. It's a way of looking at things that you're going to take on as a working hypothesis. But you remind yourself, if you have that hypothesis and follow through with it, you are more likely to act skillfully act in a way that you can't really criticize yourself because you're acting not, not to harm anybody. That's a good thing right there. And considering how powerful your views can be, and determining your actions now, and in determining your choices at the moment of death, you really want to hold on to that. It'll be confirmed at stream entry, because that's the point where you realize that it is possible to follow a path of action that leads to the end of suffering. And without that path of action, you wouldn't have gotten there. But until then, before your conviction is confirmed or verified, as the Buddha said, you've got to do your best to keep reminding yourself this is going to be important to hold on to. It's one of the reasons why he said there are different kinds of loss in life. You can lose your relatives, you can lose wealth, you can lose your health, you can lose your virtue, you can lose your right view. Of those three are not really serious, losing your wealth, losing your relatives, losing your health. Because that kind of loss doesn't necessarily take you to a bad place. You lose those things, you get them back over the course of time. But if you lose your right view and your virtue, you can do a lot of damage to yourself, to the people around you. So it's important that you hold on to this. Someone once asked me if I wanted to put the basic message of the Buddhist teachings into one sentence. For someone who knew nothing about it, what would you say? I heard another teacher say, your thoughts are not yours, which didn't strike me as especially useful. I said, your actions have results, so be very careful about what you do. The Buddha himself, when he talked about his, 
his awakening, trying to boil it down into the shortest possible formula. Came up with this, that conditionality as a principle of causality, and it had to do with your actions. It had to do cause and effect as you perceive it directly. It's not cause and effect, say, that governs the movement of the moons of Jupiter, or the orbit of Pluto or in the Sun. It has to do with what you do and say and think and how you get results from that. It was that central to his awakening. After all, his awakening taught him about action because he gained his awakening through action. And he found something that lies beyond action as a result. So that's where we're headed as we practice. He said it is possible through, through your efforts to reach the deathless, something inside that doesn't change. It's not affected by time and space because it's not in time and space. And you do it by following this path that we're working on right now, trying to put together the Noble Eightfold Path. Sometimes this factor is missing or that factor is missing, but we try to put them together till they all become one. You might translate the term atangika, eight-factor or eightfold, as having eight parts. When the parts finally get put together right, then it takes you beyond your doubts about the principle of karma. It's like putting together the pieces of a model airplane. If they don't get put together right, it doesn't fly. It may fly a little bit and then fall down. But once you get the parts put together right, it takes off. So to work in that direction, what do you do? You focus right here on your choices. Try to make them as skillful as you can. Try to bring the mind to a state of concentration, realize how things are fabricated, and then calm the processes of fabrication, like the Buddha explains in his instructions on breath meditation. And that's how things begin to get put together right.